Good morning and welcome to worship at Chelmsford Salvation Army. Our meeting today is led by our core officers, Majors Ian and Tracy Mountford. We start a series today of stories that need telling and today it's the story of creation and the fall. We look forward to God speaking to us through his word, but first, just a few announcements. It's with great sadness that we have to announce the promotion to glory of John Curtis. John was a real gentleman, a great supporter of all activities at the core, and of course, a founder member and the president of the Gentlemen's Curry Club. We would of course want to send our condolences and love to Sylvia, who after 60 years of marriage will miss him greatly, as will we all. We also extend our love to the rest of their family and to John's many friends and neighbours on whom he had a great influence. At the time of recording these announcements, bandsman Colin Wilson remains critically ill and in the intensive care unit at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. Your prayers for Colin, for the medical staff caring for him and for Helen, Daisy and Colin's wider family are very much needed. I had a conversation with Helen yesterday and she has asked me to pass on grateful thanks from herself, Daisy and the rest of the family for all the kind thoughts and promises of prayer that they have received. She appreciates every one of them and asks that you please don't stop praying for Colin as he remains critically ill. Please continue to also pray for others in and associated with our fellowship who continue to need our prayers because of health concerns, including Major Carol Chadwick, Bernard Smith, Vera Bell and Andy Tween. Full details are in the Chronicle, which is currently being administered by the COs, so if you have anything to go in there, please contact them. Please refer to the Chronicle for all other prayer concerns and news, including how to join us for prayer every Sunday morning at 9am, the after meeting coffee fellowship and details of a divisional prayer meeting tomorrow evening on Zoom at 7.30pm. Also in the Chronicle are some dates for your diary, including next week our YP annual. For this we're asking for people to send in pictures of them with their pets for inclusion in the virtual meeting. These should be emailed to Major Ian Mountford, whose address is on the screen now. Our opening song is number 56 in our songbook, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. These are old words, originally written in German in the 17th century, but they still speak great truths. Let's lift our praises to God now, and then Hazel Monday will lead our time of prayer.
Let us join together in prayer. Dear Lord, we acknowledge you are the King of Kings, almighty God, the creator of all things, and we worship you. Yet, Lord, you are also our Heavenly Father, who loves and cares for each one of us. We bow our heads in prayer to you, sinners saved by grace, and in these quiet moments we ask your forgiveness for times when our trust in you has faltered, especially in these ongoing, difficult, anxious and sad days. We know you understand, Lord, and we thank you that as your precious children, you continue to guide, direct our paths, and most importantly, you are with us always. We come to you this morning with hearts full of compassion for those suffering in body, mind and spirit, and those bereaved of loved ones. We ask in these moments they will feel your presence very close to them. We continue to feel so much concern for members of our church family, Lord, and our own families and friends. We are assured you know them each by name. Surround them with your love, your peace, your comfort and your protection. Thank you, Father, for Majors Ian and Tracy and their ministry to us in these unprecedented days. Open our hearts to the message they have prepared for us this morning. Thank you, too, for everyone involved in bringing our services into our homes each week. Bless each one for all they do in your name. And so, Lord, as we begin another week in lockdown, and all that means to each one of us, please give us the strength we need to face each day. Help us to help each other, Lord, to be kind and understanding, loving and generous with our time and talents, to trust and obey. And may we be reminded from the closing verse from Footprints. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, in times when I needed you the most, you should leave me. The Lord replied, My precious child, I love you, and I would never leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. As we remain in the attitude of prayer, let's listen now to the Lord's Prayer brought to us by members of our Corps. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power. And the glory. Forever and ever.
Good morning. Lovely to greet you all this morning through our weekly worship service. Major Tracy asked me to put some thoughts together around the theme of God, mission and me. I looked at the Bible readings that have been selected for this morning's meeting and the first in the Old Testament from Genesis chapter 1, reminding us of the story of creation, tells me that God created man in his own image. The second reading from Acts chapter 17, in verse 28, I read that in him we live and move and have our being. But how does all this help to shape God's mission for my life? I caught a snippet from a radio program earlier today that reminded me that every step of my life brings me to where I am at this moment of time. I thank God that he assures me of his daily presence in my life. I am so grateful to be surrounded and supported by those I love and respect. He has given me a loving family, good friends and many opportunities. I am assured that my life is part of his eternal plan and this continual presence is the strength that I need for me to achieve the mission he has planned for my life. All of us have a mission in life. All of us have stories that need to be told. It is so important for me to be relevant and up to date, not too dependent on traditional values, but to be ready to respond and react in these changing times. I am so grateful that I see God's plan for me evolving during these days of change and uncertainty. The song that came into my mind when I thought about my mission was written by John Gowans some while ago now. We have a gospel that matches the hour. We have discovered the true source of power. The fact that today my gospel does match this particularly challenging hour gives me such encouragement. He gives me the ability to plan and serve within these continually changing circumstances. It's something for which I am so grateful. My mission as Corps Secretary is to ensure that with God's help, we maintain our administration and financial planning as necessary to guide us forward. This can only be achieved by continually praying for clear guidance, for his help making decisions and for his wisdom to act in the right way at all times, as part of our leadership team, to make effective and worthwhile contributions as we collectively continue to plan for our future. God has also given me the opportunity to be part of our core mission in meeting some of the needs within our community. As a core, we have become so aware of the increasing needs of families who are so vulnerable during this pandemic. We are trying to offer some support by providing food bags and children's bags. The food bags and children's bags have become regular lifelines to more than 500 families in Chelmsford. A further supply is due to be delivered this coming week. With heart to God and hand to man is truly demonstrated by our actions. The mission to meet this need is certainly God-inspired. We are, are acknowledging our responsibility as Christians, responding to that greatest commandment to love one another. Someone cares, cares for me, and cares about the many circumstances of this time. Ours is not a distant God, remote, unfeeling, who cares not, about our loneliness and pain. Through the ministry of men, he gives his healing. In their dedicated hands brings hope again. John Gowans, again, the author of these words. My prayer as lockdown continues is that I will continue to search his word. I will know the encouragement of his presence and tell his story through my life to those I meet and in whatever situations I face. I know that every step of my life with his help has brought me to where I am today and by his grace I know he will continue to guide me as well in the future. 
May God bless you. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 28. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault to separate the water under the vault, from the waters above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning on the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, and let the dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land to bear fruit, with a seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, 
plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault from the sky to separate day from night. Let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky and give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky and gave light to the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. God said, let the water teem with living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth, across the vault of the sky. So God created great creatures of the sea and every living thing, which was the water teems and that moves above it. According to their kinds, every kind of winged bird according to its kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in numbers and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to their kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures moved along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the seas and the birds in the skies, over the livestock and over the wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the, in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Our second reading this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heavens and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made the nations, that we should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him 
and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set the day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Amen.
The story of the Bible begins in a garden where God and humans live together. And the biblical authors want us to see this garden as a type of temple. The top is the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is most intense. And that's where we find the tree of life. So what's this tree all about? Well, it represents God's own life and creative power that is made available to others. In fact, God's first command is that humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. So you're ingesting God's own life. That sounds intense. Yeah, this meal transforms the one who eats it, or in the words of the story, it leads to eternal life. Okay, but on the way to the tree of life, the humans have to pass by another tree called the tree of knowing good and bad. And God says that eating from this tree will kill you. How does it do that? Well, it represents taking the authority to do what is good in your own eyes. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, violence, and death. And so here's the thing. Both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. And the humans take from this false tree of life. And they're exiled from the garden for good. Which raises the question, can anyone ever get back to the tree of life? Well, later on in the story, we meet a man named Moses, and he encounters God in a desert tree on top of a mountain. Oh, you mean the burning bush? where Moses is told that he's standing on holy ground. Yeah, it's a plant on a mountain radiating with God's life and power, just like the tree of life. And God tells Moses, bring your people up to this mountain so we can form a partnership. And this partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they follow gods of their own making or receive life from the true God? And in this story, they give their allegiance to an idol. And it's just the first of many. The story goes on to show generation after generation choosing gods of their own making. And these idols were usually placed on tall hills like beautiful trees. But they're false trees of life that lead the people into self-destruction, exile, and death. It's like death's grip on us is too strong to resist. Is there any hope? Well, let's turn now to the story of Jesus. He came to announce that God's eternal life was available once again through him. So Jesus thinks of himself as the tree of life. Yes, this is what he meant when he claimed to be the vine that brings God's life into the world. And Jesus invited people to eat from him. Yeah, he was inviting people to trust him and be transformed by his life. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are, how much they love false trees of life. And so Jesus presented people with a new choice between life or death. And this time, they don't just choose death. They also chose to attack the one who sustains all of life. Yes, Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where he dies upon a tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. The tree of life has been overcome by the power of death. Well, it seemed that way, but Jesus said that he was a seed of God's life that would die in the ground, but then grow into a plant that would bear much fruit. So to defeat death, Jesus went through it. And now this new tree of life stands before us all. We can eat from it, but it will mean passing through death like Jesus, allowing our old way of being human to die. So that a new humanity can grow in its place. Yes, Jesus said he is the vine and we are his branches. So not only do you eat from this tree, you're invited to become a part of it, helping produce its fruit so that his life and love can spread through us to others. And so the story of the Bible ends in a new garden which is also a kind of temple, with the tree of life at its center, providing healing and life forever to all who choose to eat from it.
There are some incredible stories in the Bible. But there's one story that bookends the entire story itself, the story of creation and the new creation. It's the overriding story that underpins the whole context of all of the others, other stories. It reveals who God is, what God does and why he does it. It's the story that today helps frame many of our own stories and helps us to make sense perhaps of something of our individual and corporate journeys that we go on. It uh, informs us of God's mission, the mission of Jesus, the reason he came and the church's mission to the nations. And it's wrapped up in four themes, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And there are stories within the story itself and journeys within the journey of scripture that are worth telling and retelling for such a time as this. Let's take, for example, the story of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil that was retold earlier in that fantastic video produced by the Bible Project. We all know about the second tree, but often the story of the first tree is overlooked. That story helps us to understand so many of the other stories that we see in scripture. It helps us to understand some of the reasons perhaps why humanity acts in the way that it does. N.T. Wright reminds us that scripture trains us to listen to and learn from stories of all kinds, inside the sacred text and outside, and to discern patterns and meanings within them. Stories of all sorts form and shape the character of those who read them. We live within the narrative as creatures in search of an ending, in search of happiness. So stories have a lot to tell us. But unlike any other historic uh, or poetic book or story book, at its core, scripture gives us a proposition of absolute truth. In the midst of the historical narrative, it is truth, it points to truth, and it reveals truth in the word made flesh. Scripture is unique in that its stories have a story to tell, yes. But more than that, it reveals to us the very presence of God. And that's something we were reminded of in our Selkster devotions this week. The revelation of God's presence and God's glory. The place where we encounter God, his presence. For some, that's his omnipresence, that God is everywhere. For others, sometimes it's that personal encounter with God himself. So if we want to understand our story, if we want to catch a glimpse of his presence, then we need to place ourselves in the context of his story and understand something of how God is present. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 tells us that for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. From Genesis to Revelation, the story of the Bible is the story of God's purpose and his creation. And we see creation language used throughout the Bible, from Genesis, through the prophets, in many of the Psalms, in the Gospels and the letters, the theme of creation is evident. And in these two halves of history, the Old Testament and New Testament, there is a single thread that runs through them, that of God's creative and redemptional story. Ultimately, we are told and retold that story in the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection. Jesus dies and is laid in the tomb for three days. And on the third day, he rises from the dead, having broken the curse of the fall, ushering in a new creation. He is the first fruits of that new creation, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. And in him and through him, Christ offers us the opportunity of being part of that new creation. No more in condemnation, we sing, here in the grace of God. We stand in anticipation of a life and life in all its fullness, the kingdom now and the kingdom yet to come. Heaven is important, yes, but it's not the end of the world. God's plan isn't to abandon this world, the world which he said in Genesis was very good. Rather, he intends to remake it, and when he does, he will raise up all his people into a new bodily life to live in it. That's the promise of the Christian gospel. N.T. Wright reminds us that Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonise earth with the life of heaven. That, after all, is what the Lord's Prayer is about, he says, on earth as it is in heaven. So, we see God's creative power in redemption and in the purpose of reconciling our brokenness and sin, with God's own purpose for us to encounter and experience his glory in his creation. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
God's creative power and his redemptive power cannot be separated. The God who creates is also the God who redeems, and he does both with the same power and the same reason, ultimately, for his glory. Right at the very beginning of Scripture, we read these words here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. You know, this is one of the most challenging phrases in Scripture for the modern mind to comprehend. The vast galaxy we are living in is spinning at about 490,000 miles an hour. But even at that speed, the entire galaxy is so vast that it will take 200 million years to make one rotation. And there are over 100 billion galaxies just like ours. And we're told by science and scripture that there are as many stars in the heavens as there are grains of sand here on earth. And yet God spoke and it all came into being. Behind all of the scientific facts and biblical claims, there is the reality that here we are. The wonder of life and creation exists. And there is more to life than we could ever imagine. However you interpret the actual events of Genesis, literal or narrative, there is something important in the story for everyone. Firstly, we are able to learn about God and his creative nature. Secondly, we are able to learn that he is distinct from his creation and that there is a beginning and an end, but also that God exists beyond all of this in an eternal realm. Thirdly, we are able to learn that we are created with value and with a purpose. God created us because he intended love for us and he wants us to enjoy and experience life. We are loved and made to be loved. The story of creation is critical in our understanding of God's story. It's the story of our triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit working together in unity to enable us to experience all those aspects of the fullness of life. God is not only the creator, but he's also the preserver and governor of all. I, I actually love how the Salvation Army flag uh, reminds us of that in the Trinitarian colours it uses. Uh, the, the blue of the flag reminds us of the very creative nature of God the Father, whose mark is on all of creation, from the deepest uh, blue sea to the highest blue sky. It's evidence to believers and unbelievers alike that God's fingerprints are on all of creation. It's evidence that we can see, tangible. The red, it reminds us of Christ, the Word made flesh, who actually lived, flesh and blood, walked this earth. God came in bodily form and lived and dwelt among us. And by his blood, we are able to be reconciled with God. Christ became the way of salvation for us, and so that once again, we might walk with God, not just in a place called heaven, but in the reality of his new creation yet to come. Martin Luther said, now if I believe in God's Son and remember that he became man, all creatures will appear a hundred times more beautiful to me than before. Then I will proper, properly appreciate the sun, the moon, the stars, trees, apples, as I reflect that he is the Lord over all things. God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but also in the trees and in the flowers and the clouds and the stars, for God is wholly present in all creation. In every corner, he is behind you and before you. Back to the flag and the yellow at the centre reminds us that God the Holy Spirit, the Ruach of God, who breathed life into all creation, who hovered above the waters and kept all of those chaotic forces in creation in check, also today guides and prompts us in order to keep us, created beings, in check with God's own plan and purpose. He is our God-given conscience. He is the ever-present spirit who speaks to us and consciously helps to interpret God's word if we would listen to his voice. John Gowans reminds us of that in his song, or would hear the Holy Spirit if they listen to his voice. Every Christian may be Christ-like and in liberty rejoice. In this picture of the triune God at work in creation, we catch a glimpse of the rational, emotional and social nature of God. The centre of our Christian faith is not on man, nor on the church, but on God himself, God who we might experience in a Trinitarian way in and through his creation. In Acts chapter 17, verse 22 to 31, which we heard read earlier, Paul is speaking to those in the Areopagus in Athens. He's speaking to a people who, in effect, had actually put up a sign that was uh, pretty much saying uh, that uh, creation was wonderful, life was wonderful, but they didn't really know who to thank for it. They put up a sign that said, to an unknown God. And Paul tells them this, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live by temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. 
God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And then Paul goes on in verse 29 to 31 to make clear who this God is and what the consequences of ignoring his nature are. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all peoples everywhere to repent, for he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That proof of resurrection is also part of the creation plan. Our first presents were created innocence, but by, by their disobedience, uh, they were led to the fall, and the purity and their happiness was lost. And in consequence of that, we have spent the rest of history trying to find other ways and other things that fill that void, other things that stand in the gap, other things that make us happy and content. And along the way, our mistakes and sin have had consequences for others, and even for the very environment God has created in the first place to be perfect. Genesis 1 through to chapter 3 tells us the story of creation and the fall, and we heard the first part of that when uh, chapter 1 was read earlier. It's the one where which we should all be familiar, it's the one that we constantly need to retell each other, as it's critical for our understanding of the whole of history. God creates from nothing. God creates from his word. God creates for his glory. Man enjoyed purity and happiness in God's presence in the garden, but humanity chose to partake of the fruit of the forbidden tree. And the consequence they've been felt throughout the whole of human history. But there's a solution. God brings forward a solution, a new creation, in that God sends his own son to offer redemption and salvation for the world. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 24 puts the fall into context for us. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did you actually say you shall not eat a tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. It's uh, on the Alpha course that Nicky Gumbel reminds us of that in the relation to the taking of the fruit and uh, the proportion of blame. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. And the snake, it didn't have a leg to stand on. And since that day, we have uh, perhaps sought to blame each other for everything. We've not held ourselves accountable and we've all too often preferred our own needs over the needs of our neighbour. We see that in individual relationships. We see it in relationships between nations and their leaders. We see it in relationships between nations and other nations. And there are hints of that brokenness in all of our work as well. If you are an Apple user and your device doesn't work as the manufacturer intended, then perhaps just take a look at the logo on the front cover. It's an apple with a bite out of it. Well, joking aside, the story of the fall is critical to our understanding of our place in all of history. Every generation likes to think that it is the beginning of the story or that it has the answer to the story. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us otherwise. He says this, Man no longer lives in the beginning, he has lost the beginning. Now he finds he is in the middle, knowing neither the end nor the beginning, and yet knowing that he is in the middle, coming from the beginning and going towards the end. He sees that his life is determined by these two facets, of which he knows that only he does not know them. So the story of creation and the fall points to the new creation, and it also points to the reason for it. Creation for redemption, new creation. I wonder what is the relevance of all of this in the story for us today? Well, knowing the journey that you have been on and knowing the context of that journey is important. Knowing who you are and where you come from, knowing your purpose, knowing that you're loved, that's pretty important, particularly for such a time as this. And knowing certainty when there are things all around us that we don't know, are uncertain of, or fear. Knowing our story helps to underpin our faith as we face such things. In the current brokenness of this world, the story of the creation and the fall reminds us that our current circumstances 
are not the end of the story. So again, N.T. Wright, who reminds us of this, he says, it is central to the Christian living that we should celebrate the goodness of creation, ponder its present brokenness, and in so far as we can, celebrate in advance the healing of the world, the new creation itself. Art, music, literature, dance, theatre, and many other expressions of human delight and wisdom can all be explored in new ways. Wherever we are, whatever our current experience, God has placed within each of us a creative gene to engage with the brokenness around us. He has placed the hope of eternity in our hearts, and he has, by his Trinitarian presence, reminded us that we have a choice, that we can choose good over evil, that we can know his presence, and that we can participate in the work of God's new creation. We can use our God-given gifts to demonstrate justice, to minister healing, to usher in something of the kingdom now. The relevance of the story is that it is not the end of the story. Timothy Keller puts it this way. After creation, God said, it is finished, and he rested. After redemption, Jesus said, it is finished, and we can reset. This week we reached the sad milestone of 100,000 deaths in the pandemic in the UK and over 1 million deaths worldwide. And there are other situations that challenge us and there are glimpses of brokenness and fallenness all around. And we have a choice how we can respond. We can deny the reality of the evolving story or we can own it and we can recognise our part in it and we can work towards its redemption in and through Jesus Christ. In conclusion, N.T. Wright says this, Our task as image-bearing, God-loving, Christ-shaped, spirit-filled Christians, following Christ and shaping our world, is to announce redemption to a world that has discovered its fallenness. To announce healing to a world that has discovered its brokenness. To proclaim love and trust to a world that knows only exploitation, fear and suspicion. And then he concludes the quote by saying this, I believe that if we face the question, if not now, then when? If we are grasped by the vision, we may also hear the question, if not us, then who? And if the gospel of Jesus is not the key to this task, then what is? When God created, he saw that it was good. As a covenanted people, we are called to see the good. We are called to be the good. We are called to live out the goodness of God for such a time as this. The story of creation and the new creation frames the context of our story today. Knowing it, telling it, it's important for us and all of humanity to understand our story today. John chapter 20 verse 31 says, These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. So friends, I want to encourage you to take some time this week to rediscover the story of creation and the fall and the new creation. Read it for yourself. Discover it at your own, discover your own place in it and perhaps discover your own response to it. And as we conclude this meeting, we're going to turn to a song that reminds us of that story, but it also challenges us to the part we will play in it as we seek to choose good and choose God. And as you sing, perhaps you want to reflect on the words and maybe accept the invitation today. In your hearts enthrone him. There let him subdue all that is not holy, all that is not true. Crown him as your captain for temptation's hour. Let his will enfold you in its light and power. May God bless you.
and a benediction. May this eternal truth be always on our hearts, that the God who breathed this world into being, placed stars into the heavens, and designed a butterfly's wing, is the God who entrusted his Son to the care of ordinary people, became vulnerable, that we might know how strong is the wonder of love, a mystery so deep it is impossible to grasp, a mystery so beautiful it is impossible to ignore. May we love and serve you, our Creator God, this week. May we see and acknowledge your might and power, and as we see the beauty of creation around us this week, and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.